Hello and welcome to the Courage and Confidence Festival. I'm Peace Mitchell and I'm co-founder of Osmompreneur, Women Changing the World Press and the Women's Business School. Before we begin, I'd like to pay my respects to the traditional owners of the land that I live and work on, the Mamu people of North Queensland. And I pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging right across Australia and the Torres Strait. So today we are celebrating the launch of our brand new book, Courage and Confidence, and we're also celebrating International Women's Day. So happy International Women's Day to everybody who is joining us live. Um, please let us know where you're tuning in from in the comments. And uh, as we go through the presentation, please let us know any questions that you have as well. My guest today wrote the foreword for our book and also our front cover endorsement is by our guest and her name is Amanda Thompson and I'm very excited to have her joining us today for this masterclass. Please join me in welcoming Amanda. Hello, peace. Hi Amanda, it's wonderful to have you here. Uh, I forgot to mention that Courage and Confidence, all of the proceeds from the sale of this book go to providing scholarships for deserving women to attend the Women's Business School as well. And Amanda, you wrote the foreword for us and I just love it, um, the metaphor that you used of talking about courage and confidence and overcoming adversity was so inspiring. Uh, for people who haven't met you before, would you please introduce yourself and tell us a bit about you and your business and what you do? Yeah, so I'm Amanda Thompson, um, founder of Endurance Financial, which is quite quickly becoming a dedicated um, women in business financial planning practice where my views and I suppose knowledge and education is to empower women and give them the confidence to pay themselves what they are truly worth. Um, I'm also a triathlete, which once you read the foreword of the, the book, you'll um, get to realise that I can make any money or anything turn into a triathlon analogy. <laughs> oh, I feel like you've learned so many lessons from being a triathlete and that they are now, you're able to apply those lessons to life and business and everything. It is. It's, it's, it's actually a really nice way to, I suppose, for a want of a better word, attack life or a, attack the adversities in life that we, we have. And um, I've been fortunate enough to find something where my passion sits on both sides of the fence, triathlon and recreation and my job, and my passion. Yeah, beautiful. Well, um, we can't wait to hear your presentation today. So let's let's get moving and roll the presentation. I am honoured to be a part of the week celebration of Courage and Confidence and am absolutely privileged to be amongst such amazing women who have, women who have co-authored this book. Before I start my presentation, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners and custodians of the land on which we work and pay our respects to Indigenous elders, past, present and emerging. Today I sit in Yarraville, which is the land of the Wurundjeri people. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Amanda Thompson and I'm the founder of Endurance Financial. I was lucky enough to be asked to write the foreword for the new book, Courage and Confidence, and I am honoured to have this workshop today. I am committed and dedicated to assisting small business women become their own CFOs, to become confident, focused and on top of their money. And today I want to talk to you about your own salary and um, question, are you actually paying yourself what you are truly worth? I'm hoping that by the end of this session, there'll be some question and answers that we can do um, that I don't bore you too much with the presentation. So we'll see how we go. A girl should definitely be two things, who and what she wants. I have to, as I am a financial planner, give this general advice warning. And basically it says that everything in, in this presentation is of general nature only, and it shouldn't be taken as specific advice for your own situations. When it comes to paying themselves from their business, an unfortunate majority of small business owners forgo a wage or salary, preferring to simply take what they need from their business. 
which is fine if you are meeting your expenses and if you're happy doing so. But I'd like to question, how do you truly know what your business is doing? Why leave it to the accountant to make all this work at the end of the year? Isn't it better to be forward thinking just like you did when you started your business and get on top of all of these things? I want to go through some things with you today. I want to talk about your own current state of play, where your business is, is at, your own numbers. How do we start overcoming our fear of finances? I'll talk to you about my course, Financially Fit Women, and do a little money mindset task. Financial literacy can definitely be developed. And like everything, it just takes a little bit of practice and maybe some handholding from someone like me. What strategies do you use in your business to make these decisions? Most of us will rely on gut instinct. It's the same instinct that made us back ourselves when we went into business for ourselves. But what about if you could use the numbers of your business to confidently create a roadmap of what success, financial success and our personal goals could be? Creating realistic cash flow forecasts, adjusting the expenses, reaching targets, and more importantly, celebrating those targets and paying yourself what you are actually worth. How do you set your goals and success measures? Do you prepare cash flow forecasts? I set my success measures in a, in a different way every year and I strategically will pay myself a salary and I will give myself a pay rise when, when certain events occur. Probably the biggest fear that we all have is that a single bad financial decision could be disastrous for our business which more often than not is our love and our passions. But I'd like to flip that and say, if understanding these figures is such a fear, why then do we put it into the too hard basket? Are we truly scared that if we don't know what our numbers are, if we don't understand them, then we'll lose our credibility as business owners? Why is it that we feel that we have to do and understand absolutely everything in our business on our own? Do you pay yourself a regular salary? As a small to medium business owner, you are probably working large amount of hours and taking on many roles within the business. For this work, you are entitled to draw a wage. If it wasn't you doing the work, then it would be someone else and the business would be paying them a wage. And I ask you, do you know the last time you actually sat down, looked at how much you were paying yourself and gave yourself a pay rise? A little task that I do with my participants in my course is to get your personal bank accounts out, not your business ones, your personal ones, and have a look at the money coming into your account. Where is it coming from? Is it the same amount? How often is it coming from? Actually take time to get a picture of how you in your individual life are receiving money. I truly believe that if you're searching for the one person who'll change your life, go and check out that bathroom mirror. You might need a little bit of hand holding from me, but you can definitely do it because I'm going to give you the tools to do so. So let's talk profit. The dictionary describes or the dictionary has a definition that says, profit describes the financial benefit realized when revenue generated from a business activity exceeds the expenses, costs and taxes involved in sustaining the activity in question. Profit is calculated as a total revenue less total expenses. Put in our understanding, it's often referred to as the bottom line because that's where it appears on our financial statements. It's the key figure that, that is taken into account 
when everything else is gone. The goal of any company, big or small, is to make money for its shareholders. In most of your cases, that will be you. It is by far the most used metric for determining the success of the business. I want to delve deeper into this and I actually want to challenge the use of the word profit to any small business owner because at the end of the day, if you are your shareholder, shouldn't the success of the business be your financial growth, not a historical figure that sits at the bottom of a financial statement that actually your accountant can make look however he, she or you want it to look? Ask yourself these questions. How many of these questions can you answer? Does your business make a regular profit? Did your business bank account increase by the same amount of that profit? Maybe it's a task to do. Go and have a look at the year on year. So go to the 30th of June of the last financials that you had done and compare that profit figure. Is it sitting in your bank account? Was it sitting in your bank account? If it's not still sitting there, what actually happened to it? Did you spend it before it was actually created? I'm a bit of a fan of seeing retained earnings in financials and we'll go to that a little bit later on. If you're a sole trader, everything's pulled in, into the one basket. So for you, you need to go and have a look at, is your profit actually greater than your living costs? Are you just making ends meet? Where is your extra money going? So many people I know will actually refer, oh, my profit's going up, my profit margin's this, it's going down. I don't mind what someone's profit margin is as long as you're getting the money first, whether it's by a salary before the profit or as dividends after the profit. Then come and talk to me about profit margins increasing or de decreasing. I touched upon this before saying that basically that end figure of uh, financial statements of profit, an accountant can make look whatever we need it to look like. So therefore, are they really true statements? I know for one that, and I hope no one from the ATO is listening today, but I think there might be a few kids' iPads that go as expenses to my business. So when do you actually go and have a look at what expenses that are attached to your business are of benefit to you? Are you adding back these to the financial success that you receive from your business? For financial statements of the small business to be true reflections, every single expense needs to be perfect. Every single one of them. I find it hard to believe that every single one of our expenses are perfect. In my course that I run, we go through all the detailed analysis of our personal and our business cash flow to try and gauge the most accurate dollar figure that is associated with the business success. So then we can backtrack and we say, how did that profit benefit you? Or what do you need to do? And where are the gaps in your understanding or the gaps in your control? The simplicity is definitely maximizing cash flow in, decreasing cash flow out. But behind the scenes, the process isn't that simple. I'm one of these geeks that, that loves the story of financial statements. Very first thing I do when a client gives me their financials is I follow the money. Mainly I follow it out of the business. Where did it actually go? And the story that I'm told by my client to the story that the financials tell me is often very different. And to me, it says that we're not asking our accountants enough. We're not delving deeper into understanding what all of these figures mean. So therefore, how can we truly understand what they mean to us? I also compare previous financial years and look for any major discrepancies, either up or down in the key lines of both revenue and expenses. Watching where the money's coming into a business and where it's coming from is just as important as trying to maintain our expenses. There's a saying that I, I think I spoke to Peace about on 
the podcast we did the other day is that one stream of revenue is actually too close to zero. And by that, I mean that if you rely on one person, one service, one person buying your product, then you put your business at great risk. So one of the tasks or I suppose homework that I set for my business clients is to go and actually work out their different streams of revenue and put those into percentages so that they can see where the money is coming where there potentially is a risk but also to have an understanding of where they may actually put more effort in to to that particular stream of revenue the financial statements provided by an accountant though only give me the overall picture and if the aim is to be paying yourself a regular salary then you need to be understanding more than just these financials. You need to be understanding where the, the dips or the troughs are going to be in, in your year. For example, if you do employ people or you have a high turnover, you're going to have quarterly BAS statements and superannuation to pay. You might have um, spread out accounting fees or you, you could even, depending on what insurances you have. So if you don't paint the picture of those months more often than not we could be putting um you know or robbing peter to pay paul is the actual saying that we use or we just are finding ourselves not giving ourselves money that month because the cash flow won't afford it so it's all about being prepared instead of chasing your tail i'm an old school excel user i like to understand the calculations that I'm putting in. I don't really want to know the algorithms be behind the scenes. I like to have to be in control. Um, so I I like looking at just simple cash flow. And when that's read, then I need to go back through the previous months to figure out how that end figure is, is going to change. If you have a cloud based accounting software, it's even better. And if you've got a bookkeeper, it's even better. But again, but you should be asking for these reports. You should be asking for the assistance. You don't have to do everything on your own, but it is still your business. And you don't wanna see that red line in any one month. Properly tracking your multiple, multiple revenue streams may actually protect your cash flow in tough times. It helps you decide where to concentrate your efforts and potentially provide greater opportunities for growth when the times are good. General rule of thumb, no more than 25% of your income should come from one place. Similarly to personal spending, you should visit your fixed costs regularly, insurance, bank fees, interest rates, etc. Any saving in these will bring ultimate more money, ultimately more money into your business. Spending to the time to complete a budget in your accounting software is key. Finding the time to then review your budget to your actuals is even more important. So how do you go through your own figures? Do you do this during the year or do you only do it when you've got a big bill to pay and the bank account isn't looking that great? Let's talk a little bit more about overcoming your fear of finances. But before we do that, I'd like you to stop for a moment. And I want to ask you or have you think about what do you want to be able to say about your business in 2023? What did the year 2022 look like for you? And right at this very point in time, what are you loving about your business? And what are the three top focuses of your business? And of those three top focuses, how many of them rely on you understanding your figures? And probably the most important one is what gives you sleepless nights? Is it your business finances? Is it your personal finances? Or is it something else within your business? Again, any of the answers to these questions, I'm sure some of them will revolve around money. Let's go through them just one more time. What do you want your business to look like in 2023? What are you going to say 
was your business successes in 2022? Right at this point in time, what are you loving about your business? And of your three top focuses of the year, how many of them relate to having good financial security or having an understanding of your numbers? Ask yourself, do you really know and understand your numbers? Do you know off the top of your head how much tax you paid individually and in your business? And have you ever calculated your percentages of where your revenue sources are or how much money goes where? Have you thought about registering for GST? Do you know the rules around registering for GST? Do you know the tax brackets? When should you become a company? How do I get the most beneficial um, tax or how do I get as much tax benefit to ourselves? I want you to give your finances the time they deserve, just like the time you put into developing your service or your product. The best way to do this is to invest in cloud accounting software like Xero with a little initial time to set up your budgets, etc. Et it is well worth it. Or employ a virtual bookkeeper or, or learn to do it yourself. Whichever way you do this, the key is reviewing these every time you review the other important parts of your business. Example, marketing successes. So we need to talk about now, what should you pay yourself and how? When valuing a business, there are many adjustments that need to be made to normalize your financials. One in particular is an adjustment is an adjustment for owners' wages to market rates. You see, some business owners will pay themselves a small salary, some will pay themselves a large amount, and some will pay themselves not at all. They may pay themselves a dividend if they're a company, or they may distribute profits to themselves if it's through a trust structure. Either way, the adjustment is made so the financials reflect what you would pay someone to fill your shoes. As your business grows, it makes sense to pay yourself a market rate for the role you fill. If you're a plumber, pay yourself a wage equal to what it would cost to employ someone. If you want a little bonus at the end of the year or perhaps six months into the financial year, you can pay yourself an employee bonus director's fees or even a fully frank dividend. However, <clears throat> this is definitely something you should speak to your accountant about or me <laughs> uh, and it should be part of your tax planning every financial year. With my clients, I will work out a strategy with them and we'll pay a certain amount of money that will obviously meet the expenses of the, the family or yourself for that financial year. And then I say, be patient, be patient. I'm a big believer in retaining profits, having your patience. If we've got retained profits in our business, if we've got money to play with, then we can make decisions for the fi next financial year. And hopefully one of those decisions will be to increase your salary or, or start paying yourself in a different way. The point to keep in mind is cash flow is king. Sometimes you need to sacrifice paying yourself a large wage or salary to keep the business growing and innovating to reap the future benefits. So patience is the key, but developing a habit is just as important. And I spoke about this the other day for those who listened to Peace, Peace and I. Any habit that we form is, is leading us into being able to grow on that habit. So if we start paying ourselves a wage today, and it can be as little as $100 a week, I don't mind what it is, but put that habit into play. And what will happen is it will be much easier to say, I'm going to double my wage today. And you'll find yourself paying yourself $200 a week and so on and so on. But if we don't start that habit, we won't be enticed. We won't have those positive endorphins to keep changing that, to keep bringing it up. 
Now, obviously, how to pay yourself is quite a complex discussion. I'll go through some of the things that are, are important when doing this, but that's something that you should talk to your accountant about, talk to me about, or, or any other financial professional. But business structures is important. So as a sole trader, there is no requirement to pay yourself a wage or even super from your business. For tax purposes, you and your business are actually considered one and the same. Therefore, you can transfer money from your business bank account that you may not have set up to your personal bank account anytime you like. Unless you're running your business as a sole trader, the time will come when you must decide how you're going to pay yourself. Pay yourself for your time, your efforts, um, and your entrepreneurship. The profits of your business belong to the company, not you, once you become a, a company. But there are various ways in which you can extract the value you've created. There are a number of factors you can consider when deciding to pay yourself, whether it's via a salary, dividends, drawings, or a combination. Legislative restrictions include um, personal service income rules. Uh, it also legislative restrictions, if you've heard of them, are Division 7A loans. So if you run in as a company, paying yourself incorrectly or just taking money out of the company essentially becomes a loan to the business. So you can't take out more money than exceeds the amount you've previously loaned it. Making this drawing uh, leaves you owing your company money and the tax office has quite specific rules around how much interest um, is, is paid on those uh, tax outcomes. So, th so this one, we could, we could spend a whole session on structures and tax outcomes. You'll need to include any salary your company pays to you in your personal tax return and pay it at your marginal tax rate. Your company will have the PAYG withholding and, it, and superannuation and potentially even workers' compensation insurance, um, just as it does for any other employee. Reasonable salaries paid to working family members are treated exactly the same way, um, but salaries are actually a deduction to the company. And so if you can think about the company tax rate, your personal tax rate, there does become a benefit of paying yourself a salary because you're actually increasing the expenses of a company. Dividends are paid um, by a company to a shareholder after after tax profits are declared. Um, and, and the benefit of this is what I was talking about before and the patience. And the patience, so if the company's already paid the tax and the following year you take a dividend, essentially like investing in other companies, you get a, a franking credit. And so you can actually make quite strategic decisions on which avenues to take in terms of uh, paying yourself. Drawings apply when you've previously lent money to your company, so you could be paying them back or, or the company could be paying you back. But as I said before, once you surpass that amount of the capital that you may have put into your company, it then becomes a loan that you're taking and there are specific um, ATO rules uh, against that. And the last three, I suppose, are, um, or the last one, the peace of mind, what, what are you comfortable with? What is it that you want? Lending considerations should also come into play. If you're thinking of um, buying your first home, buying an investment property, refinancing, have you thought about what's going to look more benefit beneficial towards you and your family um, in terms of the salary or, or where your income comes from? So my preference my preference, is, if you haven't already guessed, is I'm a bit about pay yourself a salary. If you're a sole business and you're not turning over more than having to register for GST, so if you're turning over un under $80,000, then maybe you'll stay a sole trader. But I still believe in paying yourself a regular amount. Now, if you're a business and you tell me you need a certain amount of money to survive, then I tell you to pay yourself a certain amount of money. But that comes with time as well so as i said that you really need to get into the flow of the habit to then review and reassess it 
leads me to Financially Fit Women. <laughs> so Financially Fit Women is the course that I, I run. And there, there are essentially eight modules where we look at both your personal, your business financial goals, your long-term goals, and we put it all together. And the aim of this is at the end of the 16 weeks, you come out being your own CFO, you come out with your own specific roadmap, um, and you're confident, and you've had me the whole way. So I'm gonna to open to question and answers now, and then we're gonna come back and talk about money mindset. Ah, thank you so much, Amanda. Um, so much gold in there and advice and expertise to share with women who are learning about their finances and wanting to start paying themselves and, you know, really benefiting from their business and all that hard work that they're putting in. I think we've all just got to stop for a moment and, and decide whether it's something that we want to look at. I think we all need to, to look at it and where we start. I think that there was, I suppose I was trying to get a, a few little um, pressure points or pain points in there that might hit everyone or someone somewhere. Yeah, you know, uh, you you started out talking about the fear that some people have around their finances. And I can relate to that because I was one of those people, you know, the bank statement would arrive and I, I'd be afraid to open it because I didn't know whether it was going to be good news or bad news. And I had a feeling it was going to be bad news because I hadn't been paying attention to what was going on with my finances. And so it's really been a journey for me. And it's interesting, the amount of emotions that are tied up with our finances and our relationship to money and money stories and all of those things, which I didn't really realise until I started diving into that. Um, and you know, Peace, you're no different than anyone else and, and neither am I. I mean, I've been working as a financial planner for 20 years in the business space and I've come across all types of businesses and business people and even myself jumping into my own business for, for I mean you know my situation I was on my own with two young girls and I just had to do it but that fear of making sure that I was going to survive financially to to follow my passion but also look after two girls so a lot of what I say and what I try to teach is based on life experience um, as well but I have been fortunate enough to learn through life in terms of I have come across a lot of successful business people and some not so successful ones. So I develop my opinions along along the way. But I think that the fear of finances for me is a really big one. And I think, I mean, there's, and I don't have the data at the top of my head, but there is data to show that even though women tend to be more fearful of finances and we tend to be our biggest critics, that we're actually the ones that do the finances in families, that the, the majority, there is a larger majority of women that control the finances. Yet when it comes to us talking finances of our own business, we are so determined, passionate, confident, but also feeling judged about jumping into our own businesses that, you know, we put those blockages up to, no, no, I don't, this could mean I, I'm going to fail if I don't understand this. Yeah, it's so interesting because I've seen some stats around that as well. And women are the ones who are making the, the household decisions. So, you know, all those car ads that they tailor to blokes, it's actually the women who will have the final say in which car is going to be the family car. So they probably should be advertising those to the women. But things like family holidays and the kind of the brand of cereal that the family buys and all those kind of things mostly are decisions made by women because it's women who are managing the family finances. And so we should back ourselves to, to make good financial decisions for our business or, do you know what, more importantly for ourselves and what we're going to do with the amazing amounts of um, money that we're going to get through our businesses to do our personal goals. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So um, I, it was interesting in your presentation you talked about watching the revenue and the expenses, and that's something that you like to do, like understanding where the money's coming in and how much money's going out and how that changes at different times of the year or from one year to the next. And it's kind of like 
you're getting a, a story about what's happening in the business from looking at those expenses. Would that be would that be accurate? <laughs> yes, so that's the geeky part of me and and, and financials. <laughs> but I think it's also um, I have a problem with financials in that they show a snapshot of a year, which is why I like monthly cash flow forecasts. And and, and realistically, um, we're mums. And so, therefore, we have children that are either at home or at school. And we, we, we've spoken about this brief, um, briefly piece that the mum, mother guilt, it exists, it's there. So, for me, having as much time on school holidays is really important. So, if I use my own situation, um, Christmas, Christmas period is really minimal in terms of what income I'm going to generate. But it doesn't mean that I can just close my eyes and think, oh, I'll deal with that next year. I prepare for it in, in advance. And that's what doing monthly monthly um, cash flow forecasts. But also, just like anything else that, you know, I, I, I'm learning about marketing, so I'm not very good at this, but I'm actually learning and watching um, what is productive or, or not in terms of marketing things and so just like we review that and what works we should be doing the same thing for where the money's coming in or, or going out on a regular basis yeah absolutely absolutely and I, I remember katie and i got to a point in our business where we just seemed to be working so hard but not seeing any results and and it was that we were at the point where we just wanted to quit and we realized that we needed to look at everything and work out which things were truly bringing us a return on investment because there were some things that we were doing, we were spending hours doing them and they just weren't bringing us as much money as other things that we were doing in our business. And it's really important to understand where the money's coming from, which things are the best sellers and, and which things have the most profit in them as well because maybe for people who are selling products and things like that, some items have a bigger profit margin than others. Oh, absolutely. And um, when I, I mean, as I said, I've worked with very large businesses as well, but the the concept's still the same. I'll often say to business owners who are trying to, you know, still wear lots of different hats because it's their family business. And I'll mm. say to them, where are you most productive? Where in this particular business, where do you sit that makes or generates the best return on investment? Or if you've got business partners, like I mean, the classic example um, uh, uh, trades type companies, and you, mm. if you've got business partners, normally one of those business partners is actually a really good people facing person, and the other one is the the staff. Um, and getting the people running and, and doing the actual hands-on things. But there's nothing wrong with taking on those separate roles. They don't have to both take on the roles. So it's the same even if you are a sole trader in, in your business of what you can or can't or, or want to or can afford to outsource as well. Yeah, outsourcing is um, it's really important. But, you know, we should outsource our finances to a bookkeeper or an accountant, but it's not just as easy as just handing everything over and then expecting them to do it. You actually have to know what's going on yourself. And you want to be able to review those figures that come back at you and have an understanding of what that means to, to your business. And, and I can't stress enough, more importantly, to what's coming out of that business to you and your family for, you, for your future. And I think we we're so, um, you know, we're so pushed for time at the best of times that it, mm. it's a hard one to do. But with the right hand holding and the right people in your corner, those reviews become easier and easier each year. And, and again, with the right advice, they probably become more exciting each year if you start yeah. to develop those habits. Yeah, absolutely. As you learn what you're looking for and, and things that you can do to improve those results as well, like little tweaks that you can do make a big difference sometimes. Oh, yeah. And, and you know, we're, we're business women. We've jumped into our businesses. We can do anything. We, we, you know, we have the courage and we have the confidence to do anything that we want. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And I feel like for any women out there who are watching, who, who do have that fear around their finances, it's okay. That's, that's the message that I want to give them. It's okay. But take steps now to be proactive and learn more about what to do with your finances. Reach out to someone like Amanda. Start listening to podcasts about finances. Read books about finances and 
just start upskilling and over time you will get better at it. It is a skill that everybody can learn and everyone can get better at. And I think that um, the other part of that, which I'm very big on too, is I suppose understanding what your own personal money story is. I mean, you've touched upon a little bit of your saying that that fear of receiving the bank statements. Um, mm. you know, so if you go back to that point in time, that, that's a trigger for you. You know, there's other things. So, And it's not just about the negatives. It's what are the triumphs? What are the money triumphs that you've had? Or when did you learn the value of money? If you can actually go back to some of those points in time, you'll be able to, in your own mind, figure out why you are the way you are with money, good, bad, or indifferent now. Mm. You know, I, I talk, um, you know, I, and I know um, my, my daughter's actually listening to this, so I might, you know, be a bit careful. But I remember um, getting a, a sexually transmitted debt when I left. <laughs> um, you know, and that, that's a money tragedy for a financial planner to not know that was going on. But it wasn't so much that it was a whole lot of CityLink fines that I didn't know about that came knocking on my door one Christmas. Um, oh. So, yeah, really fun for a mother, tr single mum trying to buy Christmas presents. <laughs> um, but but I understand that and I've learned from that and, and you know, that, that takes me on into life and I'll teach my children about STDs. <laughs> <laughs> it's an important lesson. <laughs> In <laughs> lots of um, <laughs> ways. <laughs> um, there was something else you said today and it was one stream of revenue is too close to zero found that really interesting. Can you elaborate on that a bit more, please? It is. So let's go to the simple um, part of if selling, a, selling a product instead of just a service. So if you're selling a product and it's only one product, um, mm -hmm. then that's fine, but you would have to have a lot of um, revenue or purchases of that product in different areas. So um, in different stores, for example. So you wouldn't want that product to be sold in just one store because that's a huge risk um you know is for myself if i just relied on referrals from a single accountant for example and then that accountant wasn't an accountant anymore then i'm i'm losing that um well um, my whole business is at risk or the whole new business is at risk so i think it's really important and sometimes we don't realize that we do have different revenue streams so i'm a financial planner and I am my product, so to speak. But it doesn't mean that there isn't different avenues. So I do one-on-one -on -one financial planning. I, mm. I I have my course um, and I do workshops or, or, or you know, for, for companies or things like that on our money mindset. So I do have different streams of revenue. The benefit of separating them is one, I can see where the return on investment's coming or where the expenses are held, but also I am protecting myself that, for example, COVID and doing one-on-one -on -one in in live, in you know, in, in real life events and workshops at companies decreased, but I was lucky enough to have backups. That, that's the best way I can explain it. <laughs> yeah, and I think having um, different streams of revenue is a great way to protect to like protect yourself from all kinds of unexpected challenges that can come up and COVID was such a great example of that people who had different ways of, of running their business were able to pivot quickly um, and others it was a lot harder and some businesses you know haven't come back yet no there, there are and, and I suppose then again that jumps into um, passive income too, starting to build wealth outside of our businesses. Now, whether that's superannuation or, or investment, it actually mm. goes for that as well. It shows the importance of having you know, not so much backup plans but protection in place or, or working towards our personal goals. So the other thing you talked about, um, of course, is about paying yourself and the just statistics I've seen is that less than 50% of Australian women are paying themselves and it just seems crazy you know they're paying their suppliers and distributors and marketing and all the other expenses but they're not paying themselves in their business and when I saw those stats I was like oh well maybe maybe that's in the first year or two but no the research was showing that women who'd been in business for 20 years were sometimes not paying themselves so I just think it's so important that we change the narrative around this and it's International Women's Day today 
and everybody watching, I hope you're paying yourselves. And if not, find a way to start doing it. It's it's too important. You can see the hairs if you're a bit closer. That it's, it's a, as you can tell, something I'm very passionate um, about. We work so hard, all of us in our own business, and we should be reaping the rewards. And if you're not paying yourself, I wonder, and I'd be really interested, how do you truly celebrate the success of your business if you're not doing something personally? So, yes, having time if you've chosen to go into business for yourself for time, flexibility and being with your family, but you're still working and you should still be paid accordingly to the hours that, that you work on your business. Um, and, and, you know, here's my triathlon analogy. It's coming. <laughs> positive <laughs> energy breeds positive energy. So, you know, something positive yes. like paying ourselves a salary, so positive endorphins, they, they keep going. So it is actually you'll find, and I think I, I did mention it in, in my workshop there, is that you'll find that if you celebrate that you give yourself a pay rise, you'll want to keep doing it. So you've got that <laughs> push. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And it can be a small amount. You might start out just paying yourself $50 a week to start with and then increasing that over time. But I think it's important to at least give yourself some kind of incentive for all the work that you're doing, because otherwise, really, what's the point? Absolutely. And I also throw it a little bit wider. Um, if you have children, which I do, what are we teaching them if we're not taking a salary for all the hard work that we're doing? What, what actually are we teaching them? That mum just sits at the computer all day, it's on the phone all day, and when I ask her how much she earns or how much salary she gets, she can't tell me. You, you know, um, I, I think that's important too. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So if anyone has questions, if you're tuning in and watching us live, please um, post your questions in the comments. It's a great opportunity for you to have a chat with Amanda and have your questions answered. So, Amanda, you said that financial statements only tell some of the story. So what are the other ways we can look at our business and, and see what's working? So I think um, one of the, I mean, I do several tasks throughout my course, but one of them is, as I said, you look at your own personal bank account for one and in, mm -hmm. you People always expect that you're going to say, look at your expenses, where's the money going? But what about where's the money coming from? So how often do you look at your own personal bank statement and say, well, where does the money come? Does it come regularly? Am I paying myself ad hoc just as my personal bank account gets to nearly zero? Yeah. And I know that bank, and I bet you heap of people would be nodding there. Yep, I see my balance go. So I move some money from my business to my personal. So, but when did you really assess that? So that's one of the, the figures I think we should be looking at. Um, and as I said, I think cash flow forecasts and then comparing those forecasts to actual uh, to see whether there is any, like, you know, has something gone up and you've not realised or was there a glitch or was there something that you spent lots of money on in, in one particular month or did I receive lots of money in, in one particular month? Um, I, th I think that's really important, but you've got to spend the time to break down those expenses. Uh, a lot of the times with sole traders or, or um, small business owners, I'll get the financials and, you know, everyone will know what their financials are. The expenses are there and there's certain headings, so accounting, superannuation, wages, and in particular superannuation and wages, I'll actually get people to separate that one stream down and say directors, Wages, directors superannuation, directors fuel for a car, what, what you know, directors, specific directors mm. expenses. So if you aren't paying yourself necessarily, you can go and have a look and say, yes, but my business did give me that this value. And I don't know whether many people could say that their business gave them X amount of value in, in a year. Yeah. So um with paying yourself, do you think that businesses that are just starting out should be reinvesting back into their business or should they start paying themselves even if it's a small amount at the start? I think that you should start by paying yourself what you need or at least have a backup to what that is. So if you're not going to pay yourself out of the business, 
I would like to see a separate bank account. And, and I did this. So here, here you go. This is what I did. I had the equivalent of six months worth of wages when I jumped into Endurance Financial saved in a, in a separate bank account. And the view was that I was going to, when I say wages, expenses, what I need, what I knew I needed so that the girls and I had a roof over our heads and good food. And I still had bikes. You know, so triathlon. Um, but um, that amount of money was sitting there with the view that I was going to be paying myself a certain amount each week from that so that I didn't lose track of what general living expenses were and things like that. So either you're going to do it from the business and you factor that into your business plan. And I think people should be doing business plans every single year, no matter what their business structure is because it's your business. Yeah. So you should be doing a business plan that talks about these things. So um, so that that's the two alternatives. You put the money into the business and factor in what you need to pay yourself. And it doesn't have to be a huge wage because we know that we're starting out. We know that we're on a journey. But if you, if you start from the very word go paying yourself, then you don't have to have, we don't have to have this conversation in a year's time and you've got into the habit of not paying yourself. So it's an easy habit to start. Yeah, I love that advice. And I think that planning is so important, but so many business owners don't plan. They just kind of roll along. I'm not sure what they do, but yeah, business planning is so important. And financial planning, I love that you had that set amount of money already organised so that when um, you launch, you had that. Yeah. Do, do you know the other thing too? Yes, there's that. The other other time that I find a lot of people come to me as small business owners, I want to buy a house. I want to refinance my house. I want to buy an investment property. And all of a sudden I need to understand how I pay myself, what my salary looks like and, and what the bank's going to want. Wouldn't it be better to just start that process out properly or at least now that I've got you thinking about it think okay actually yes maybe a property of some sorts on the on the horizon for me I want to get my finances in order so that when I go to the mortgage broker I can know what I'm supposed to provide and what's going to look good for me again marrying up um, your personal goals with what your business is there for yeah Absolutely. Well, thank you so much, Amanda, for being our presenter today for this masterclass. And thank you to everybody who has watched and joined us live and everyone watching on the recording. If you have more questions for Amanda, please, by all means, post them in the comments. But if people want to reach out and contact you, Amanda, what's the best way for them to find you? So it's um, at Endurance Financial on Instagram, just PM me or just amanda at endurancefinancial.com.au. Send an email and then we can connect from there. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much, Amanda, and thank you, everybody. That concludes uh, day two of the Courage and Confidence Festival. We're launching our new book and happy International Women's Day. And we will see you all again tomorrow for day three of the Courage and Confidence Festival. Thanks, Amanda. Bye, Thanks, everyone. Kate.